when when I decided to um, go in, go and join uh, John D. Rockefeller III's program, uh, Foundation Working in Asia, my father for years had been trying to persuade me to go into the Foreign Service. And I kept saying no. And at first, when I went to work for Nelson Rockefeller, he said, well, you're young yet. And then when I decided to go to get my doctorate, he said, oh, well, that'll be good for you in the Foreign Service. Okay. Now I finished my doctorate, and I'm getting ready to go back into the field of development, the foundation world. He said, well, you know, you really should go into the Foreign Service. I said, look, I said, you know, Dad, I said, I know exactly what it's like in your staff meetings. I said, you're sitting there, and there's an issue which has arisen. And you go around the room to get the views and opinions of your subordinates. And so one person says, your deputy chief of mission says, well, Mr. Ambassador, on the one hand, so and so, and on the other hand, so and so. And you go all around the room, and people keep giving you these two hands. And then there's a bright young person sitting at the end of the table, and he's watching your facial expression and body English. And he figures out that you really are in favor of one of these positions. And he comes out with this position that you really are in favor of. And you say to yourself, ah, that's a bright young man. I said, when it's all said and done, it is you who have to make the decision. And you send it off. And what happens is, if that is a decision or recommendation that it's accepted, everybody, the whole embassy goes around saying, we're, we're wonderfully smart. But if it's a bad decision and rejected, everybody says, well, the old man dropped a clinker. I said, now, you take that. And the reason is that in virtually all of your posts except two, you've been chief of mission all the time you've been in the Foreign Service. I said, you learned how to accept decision-making responsibility and leadership. I said, I want to go out into a setting where I'm going to be able <laughs> to acquire that same set of skills. Because I was going to go out to Asia to cover five countries and be in charge of their whole program in that region. So now I'm going to be building a program from the bottom up, and I'm going to be the person in charge of it. And uh, my father looked at me, so I said, OK. <laughs> Now, years later, uh, when I became president of Michigan State University, my dad said, he said, Cliff, he says, you far exceeded anything that you could have done. <laughs> in the state of but it was, it was a case of where uh, he, he wanted the best for me, and I knew that. But he never, ever, I, I, cannot, I can't think of a case of where he really unloaded uh, to me uh, his feelings of anger and frustration and so on. Uh, another characteristic that I've discovered from uh, working on my autobiography uh, is um, what I call a fundamental, I guess it's a combination of curiosity and personal control. Uh, I like to know where I am and what I have. And one of the things that I discovered was that uh, we travel by ship. And every ship I ever went on before we even left port, I would canvas the ship top to bottom. I'd go to the bridge where I wasn't supposed to be, but the captains let me go up. I'd go down to the engine room, I'd go to the kitchens, I'd go to the dining room. I'd find out where everything was. I had to know where everything was, okay? Every ship I went on, okay? Now, I thought that was interesting. Then I realized, when I went to the State University of New York as chancellor, I visited all 64 colleges and campuses in the first 10 months I was in office. And some of them had never been visited by the chancellor before. By the time I finished, I knew every single campus in that system. Then, TIA CREF, when I became head of TIA CREF, chairman and chief and executive, largest pension fund in the world. I spent two week, two days traveling every single floor in the three headquarters building here and met every single employee. And I suddenly said, this is a pattern. I had a lot of other examples. This is a pattern I have. I insist myself on knowing what it is. And uh, I refer to that as footsteps of owner on the factory floor is equal to 100 supervisors. It's a wonderful Chinese expression. But that is me, and I had not realized. I have a basic curiosity of knowledge to learn, and it's part of my, I've got to, I want to know. I want to be in a position where I have the facts. One last example. Uh, when I was uh, elected to the Board of Directors of Equitable Life, the insurance company, I was the third black in the country to be elected. The others were Sam Pierce and Weaver, former cabinet officer, secretary. Um, when I was asked, I said, okay, I will do this. I said, but 
I'm going to dedicate a dire week to come over to the offices here, and I want to meet with all of the vice president divisions, heads, anybody you think I should. I want them to brief me on the company. So for an entire week, I start off in the morning, spend the whole day with different divisions in that company to learn about that company, about that those divisions and the activities of the company. When I finished, and I went to my first board meeting, the chairman of the board said to the other board members, that you know, Cliff Wharton just went through this exercise, he said. And I have to tell you, he knows more about the company than he knows the book. No, I didn't find any, and I, I found very little in ways of any there. Yeah. Uh, the, my, see, <laughs> my, um, there were, uh, in my class, there were four blacks. Um, the, uh, now that's, you know, a doubling of my father's too in, in Boston Law School. But, um, no, I, I, I had occasional incidents, but nothing major. Um, it was not that. The, um, the experience of being at Harvard was the experience of being at Harvard. Uh, and um, it was, um, I had a lot of fun. Um, as I say, I was on the radio station. I was in track uh, and uh, was doing extremely well in track until I pulled a muscle. Uh, I had a, a great time. I, mean, it was, you know, I was learning, studying, and so on. It was not a, I don't think that um, I can think of major incidents. I mean, there are occasional ones, but nothing, nothing major. Did um, you date interracially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was? It, you know, it was, it, you, um, there were times when um, the, um, there might be some reaction, but it was not, uh, not anything that I paid that much attention to. Uh, but I had, um, I had a lot of, um, most of my, uh, my, most of my dates were, were black girls. I, I didn't, you know. But it was not a, it was a case of where you had um, friends, friendships, you know, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, my, uh, now my roommates um, uh, were black and uh, a Mexican, Hispanic. Yeah. Um, but it was, um, and I understand that one uh, one bed stayed empty. Because yes. Yeah. 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 That was, but that was at the beginning, uh, when uh, when it was just uh, Harold May and myself, and I knew why that bed was empty. And when I asked them about it, they you know, they kind of mumbled or the rest of it. And so they said, I said, well, you know, why don't you put somebody who's Spanish in there? You know, I speak Spanish, <laughs> and so that's how uh, they've got uh, Carlos Blanco. And Carlos said, you know, tell them. I, mean, I taped this. He said that they. Asked him, would he mind being with the black, uh, two black men? And he said, I told him, he said, I would prefer it. <laughs> well, that's typical of Carlos. But, uh, no, but it was, that was, the, that was the kind of level at which those things happened. But it never, uh, you know, to me it was, ah, okay, you, know, you can, don't spend your time, energy uh, kind of worrying about it. You can do something about it if you can, but it, you don't. Uh, don't stop. At least I never let it stop me in terms of that kind of reaction. Well, I had been working for five years for Nelson Rockefeller in my first job and um, in programs of technical assistance in Latin America. And um, because this was a new field, brand new field of uh, foreign technical assistance, um, I quickly realized that I needed more uh, academic preparation if I were going to use this as a permanent field, professional career. And uh, I had some, I was working for some wonderful people, uh, and one of them, uh, one of my superiors, the vice president of the organization, uh, suggested that I really should go and get my PhD in economics. And we discussed the different schools. And um, the because I had not trained in any field of agriculture or the rural areas, which is what most technical assistants did, uh, he suggested that uh, probably I should consider going to the University of Chicago. Now, it turned out that a few days after we had had this discussion, he asked me to come into his office, and here was a very tall gentleman, and he said, uh, he said I want you to meet Theodore Schultz, who was the chairman of the Department of Economics at Chicago. And um, it just happened that I had read or tried to read an article in the first issue of a journal called Economic Development and Cultural Change, an article by Schultz. 
And so I blurted out and I said to him, I tried to read your article last night. He said, but I couldn't understand it. He said, that's not the first time. You know. And wonderful man, wonderful man. And it turned out that he, Schultz, was about to um, head up a pro project to evaluate all U.S. technical assistance in Latin America under a Ford Foundation grant. And uh, soon after that, he invited me to come to Chicago as his research assistant on this project, and I would have an income and be able to go to school and get my doctorate in economics. And um, he became my mentor and was my, my boss in this project. And because, of course, I had the years of experience, a few years, in Latin America, working in Latin America for Nelson Rockefeller, and I was bilingual in Spanish, and this was my field. And so, therefore, I spent four years uh, there working with him. And Dolores and I were there in Chicago together. Uh, struggling like all graduate students. Uh, Living on $15 a week in food. for the three of us. Yeah. And, uh, $15 yeah. mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it was a, uh, an incredible experience for both of us. And uh, it gave me the base of preparation in economics, which I needed. Uh, following that, I then came back to New York to work for John D. Rockefeller III in his program of um, uh, development in Asia, uh, which was agricultural development in Asia. And so then for the next uh, 17 years, well, I guess 13 years, I was working for Nelson, for John D. Third. And of those 13 years, with six of them, we spent living in Southeast Asia, where I headed up our program in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Malaysia. But we were going back and forth <coughs> to Asia during those periods here at, when we were living in New York City. Mm -hmm. As and well. Mm -hmm. you, you were based mainly in Singapore and, and Kuala Lumpur. Lumpur. And Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. well, we traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cliff traveled. And yeah. the foundation was very good about having spouses travel with yeah. the uh, executive. So Dolores would go with me on trips. Or if, if I were away and she were back at, uh, at home in Singapore or Kuala Lumpur, if anyone came who was one of our fellows or grantees, she would know who they were. From other right? countries. From other countries. And, she and would, I did a lot of it. Yeah. It was, and, great. It was uh, wonderful. You know, very good. Mm -hmm. And now, you're, you're uh, not exactly a, a farm guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're advising on, on well, agrarian. Well, let me, let me explain. <laughs> totally academic. Let me explain. Um, the, um, I belong to a very distinct group, I frequently say which is the CBCBCREA, and that's the City Born, City Bred, City Raised Agricultural Economics Association. <laughs> and in order to be a member of this group, this very elite group, you must be, never have been born on a farm, raised on a farm, or studied agriculture, but you're an agricultural economist. Now, the reason that uh, I, this is an inside joke for, many, for a few of us is that Theodore Schultz is an agricultural economist. And because I was studying with him, he was my mentor, uh, I took two courses from him and one from another one of his colleagues in agricultural economics. But all the other courses I took were regular econ were traditional economics and micro, macro, money and banking, et cetera. But in the discipline, because I worked on the problems of economic and agricultural development, and because I trained with, particularly with Theodore Schultz, I'm known as an agricultural economist. And so my, much of my, a great deal, not all, of my work is in the field of agriculture or agricultural economics. So my, uh, my book is on subsistence, agriculture, and economic development. Uh, and, um, but I did do a lot of research and publications on, on international trade. On and you studied with a lot of the very famous economists like Milton Friedman yeah, and yeah. Some, you know, some of the so other it's stellar a, But I, I was, I'm, I'm really trained as an economist, and that's it. But... My field of interest and specialization is agricultural development. And so, but the work of the foundation was to, uh, we had, I had visiting professors working under me in the region. I had made grants to universities for research on problems dealing with agriculture. Uh, I had um, fellowships, which I gave to people to come to the states to receive their PhDs in various disciplines relating to development. And many of the leading uh, economists and social scientists in that region are my former grantees or my former students. I taught during the years that we were in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, I taught on an average 16 hours a week as well. So I taught courses in principles of economics, econometrics, economic trade, and so on. 
but many of those students in my classes are leaders in the region today or were people that I gave uh, fellowships to to come and study. For example, the um, President Lee, the, the pre Taiwan. President T. H. Lee of Taiwan. Okay, he received a fellowship from my organization to go to Cornell, uh, and I've known him since he was at Cornell. Now, what was it like um, raising? Uh, what you had two young children at that? Yes, Bruce Clifton was uh, five. No, no, you five, six, six when we went out, and, Bruce, and he'd been born in in New York, and, and then Bruce, Bruce was born in Singapore. What was it like to? set up a household and raise a family in, in, Wonderful. The well, in my case the we I had originally made a commitment to be out there for 10 years and uh, the head of the foundation Arthur Mosier whom I had first met when we were at Chicago because he was working on the same project in Chicago a wonderful wonderful man another one of my great mentors um, he had um, come back to the States and had then become head of this new foundation that John D. Rockefeller III had set up. And um, he was very anxious for me to come and join him as, a, uh, as, his, as an associate. And although I had not yet finished my doctorate, I had not finished my thesis actually, uh, I decided that this was a wonderful opportunity, even though it meant changing from Latin America to Asia, uh, I thought it had wonderful opportunities. So the net result was that I went to work for ADC and I went out to Asia, but I promised him 10 years. But he needed me back in New York to head up a program working with U.S. universities. And the program was to give grants to budding young scholars and faculties to do research abroad. And so we made grants all over the United States to major universities. We had workshops all over the U.S. And so I had, I came, Dolores and I came back to, for me to head up that program. Now the goal, not the goal, but the expectation was that after I'd been back here for about two or three years, I became vice president of the foundation. And it was fully expected that when Mosier retired, I would become the head of the foundation. And that's what, it was pretty well known that that's what was probably going to happen. And that's where, where we had sort of the expectation of our future life because I was enjoying it. It was uh, thoroughly delightful, uh, very contributive in terms of field. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, at that point I was doing two major, in addition to the research project grants, um, I was also exploring the possibilities of setting up an institute on poverty, to do work on poverty, and another was to duplicate the program we had in Asia in Africa and made two or three visits to Africa exploring the possibilities for that. And it was at that point that Michigan State <laughs> interrupted it. Was, was it, uh, when you were living in Asia, how much, uh, what years were those that you were living we in? We went out in 58. 58 yeah. mm -hmm. I began working with ADC in 1957, but we were there from 58 to 64, came back in 64, and then we were in New York until 1970 when we went to Michigan State. Now, obviously, during that period of time, the events in the United States were, were <coughs> going at a fever pitch, and Absolutely. a great deal was True. happening. The one the Aspen Institute. The young executive program. Because those are these, middle managers. Those are middle managers who are already in the corporation six to ten years, and now needed a different set of skills and competencies and exposures to allow them to move up the ladder. And um, what kind of exposures? What kind of well, the, skills? the program where we described they were, the they were older, the, more mature. They they had more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. They weren't students. Yeah. These were people in in corporate America. They already made their decision to go with a particular country, company. The company had identified them as being highly upwardly mobile, yeah. high potential, high right. potential. Mm -hmm. And so you were giving them. And they they had, they had, the companies identified their, their their young people. Then they sent them to the Aspen Institute to my program, and they paid for it. Yeah. This is the program we described with the four visiting people each day. And talk, you know, right, yeah. and so that was to give them what, a, a better grounding, a different in terms perspective of, of what goes on in the boardroom and from from the very top down to how a corporation yeah. runs from the top, rather than just seeing it from their desk, which is very different from getting up in the top. It. And do you feel at this stage that the program, as you initially envisaged it and started it, 
is no longer necessary, that times have changed enough that this is not necessary? Oh, yeah, it still goes on. Yeah. It I, continues, yeah, but, the I, I Aspen, but the Aspen <clears throat> Institute is running yeah, it. Yeah. And things have changed. I can't do it anymore. I, I've, oh, but also, I, wanted the, I want the program to continue. And at my age, it's time for me to start turning things over somebody else. <laughs> but I think the, the other thing, though, is that there's no question but what the nature of the issues that are confronted now have changed and modified. Mm. Um, it is not that we don't have any sort of senior vice presidents, executive vice presidents. We do. We do. Uh, and now the nature of this question about upward mobility is modified. It's not quite the same. It's not that they're being blocked. It's uh, what are the other skills that are needed to, to get up there? Um, and the other question, too, in my mind, has been the fact that um, there has been the, the use of the term diversity, by and large, in many corporations, has become much more acceptable. Uh, the last, one of the last programs that Dolores had uh, was a, a program on diversity at the Committee for Economic Development. CED is probably the leading think tank institution for people from the business world in Washington. And we're both members of it. And um, we had a program with some of the graduates, uh, alumni or fellows of her program, meeting and interacting with corporate CEOs in that session. They did and, a few. And it was in terms of diversity. Uh, it, it's different. Uh, one of the critical differences is that most corporations now have chief, uh, officers in charge of diversity. They have committees on diversity. Uh, so it's, it's not the same as when Dolores started this program. In uh, Albany. In, in Albany in the 1970s. It's just a different period. The world has changed. <laughs> I'm tempted to say great fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, uh, First of all, I'm a policyholder. I have been since 1956. It's a very unusual company, which um, was started by Andrew Carnegie to provide pensions for the faculty at Cornell University. And he was going to do it out of his own pocket, but he finally discovered that he didn't have enough money even for that. Um, it's, it developed uh, some very unique characteristics at the time. Uh, portability. You could take your pension money with you when you went from one university to another. Um, it developed a system whereby, at that time, you put your money in, and then you took it out as an annuity. Gave you a high level of security. Uh, the company did all the investing, et cetera. Uh, by the time I came along, uh, the company was in serious trouble. Uh, mutual funds were salivating at the prospect of trying to get money out of TI Cref. But the policyholders could not take their money out. Uh, TIA Cref only offered two options of choices: TIA fixed income, Cref equities. That's it. Um, there was quite an up uproar. And so uh, <clears throat> the boards, there were two boards, TIA board and Cref board. And the then CEO decided that I think they needed to go outside to get somebody to to come in and make the changes that were necessary. And um, they, uh, they approached me about uh, becoming chairman and CEO. I won't go through all the details of it, but suffice it to say that as oftentimes happens, um, one of the key people in this was Andrew Brimmer, Andy Brimmer, who was on the board of TI Craft. Terrific. And Andy, was on, and Andy was on the Equitable Life board with me, and he was on the Gannett board with Dolores so. Um in any event, I came in, and um, from an administrative standpoint, it was one of the smallest things that I'd run in a long time. It only had, I think, 2,500 employees. Okay. Asset-wise, huge. Uh, Policyholder-wise, huge, but not big managerially. Um, it was very clear to me what needed to be done. Um, I. Um, I brought in and did a complete uh, restructuring of the organization, top to bottom, uh, changed the management structure. Uh, I then developed a whole new system of um, new developing for new funds, new options, uh, new options allowing for people to take their money out, uh, particularly out of CREF, out of TIA, it had to be over a 10 year period, um, and just revolutionized the whole company. Um, and you doubled the assets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was. 
the, the fun part of it for me was that here I'd been on corporate boards since 1969. And I'd been on 10, 12 corporate board, major corporate boards. And uh, I knew what it, what it was involved. I'd been on an insurance company board, uh, which is what TIA legally is. Um, I had um, watched CEOs, selected CEOs. I knew you know, what, what made them good or not bad or what was involved. And here I'm going to run, you know, I'm going to be a CEO. OK, great, I know. And um, the, um, the company desperately needed to be changed. I mean, it was just. And they knew it, but they didn't quite know how to do it. I knew how to do it, so bingo, I got them moving. And uh, once I got it going, I mean, it took off like a skyrocket. It, it transformed it very rapidly, uh, so rapidly, in fact, that some of our competition, who had been salivating at the prospects of getting some of those TI Cref assets, those billions, uh, were very upset with me. And they said, you move too fast. You know, I did. But it was not... Um, it was not rocket science. I mean, I'll give you one example, which I think is, may explain it. Uh, when I said I visited all fours, floors in the three buildings, when I finished, I said to the man in charge of buildings, I said, you know, I said, I bet you I can tell you which units in the company are giving us the greatest difficulty. He said, really? I said, yeah. And I had made a list. He said, yeah, those are the ones. I said, I know why. I said, nope, I wouldn't want to work there. The building, those areas were congested. They were dark, dreary. I said, I wouldn't want to come and work here. I said, you've got to change this. So one of the things that I recommended to the board was, without changing our budget, was to remodel these areas, reduce the density, make it lighter, more attractive, and so on, appealing. I then discovered from the human resource people, we had a 26% turnover rate. I said, good Lord, this is terrible. Well, what happened was, every time I would change one of the areas, turnover rate would drop. And by the time I finished it, uh, the remodeling of the buildings and so on, it was down about 6 or 8%. But, but again, it was not rocket science. I mean, I, I knew what the issues were, I knew what the problems were, and I went in and did it. Well, what happened was, I was due to retire at 65. And the board was concerned that I would be leaving before uh, all of the changes that I had begun would be solidified. And they asked me to stay on, what was it, for two years or three years? It was two, two years, I think. And I had one more year to go when the uh, Clinton administration asked me if I would uh, be interested in being Deputy Secretary of State. Yeah. And you had avoided politics, yeah. government, right. the right. whole thing. Right. What made you change your mind? <laughs> it's a very good question. <laughs> 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 uh, well, everybody's entitled to one mistake, right, <laughs> in life. Um, I think um, the simple answer is um, I was invited to go to the economic summit that Clinton had uh, after his election in Little Rock. And uh, he had pulled again, convened some of the outstanding people in various fields, economics as well as business, in the group and a range of issues. And <clears throat> during that two-day meeting, he and Al Gore, and particularly he, the president, chair, president-elect Clinton, chaired that meeting. He was president then. No, he had more than president. No? Yeah. And um, he, uh, I would say, I have never, ever seen a president behave the way he did. It was absolutely incredible. The business people who were there, friends of mine, who talked about it, it was the greatest tour to force the ever seen of a president. He knew every one of these issues in depth. I mean, he was talking to some of the country's leading experts on these subjects. And by his questions and comments, you could tell he had a profound knowledge of all of those topics. And my reaction, I came back and I told him, I said, you know, I said, this man is the most intelligent president we've had that I know of. Brilliant. And he really understands these issues. And so um, when he um, uh, and Vernon Jordan had uh, said to me at one point, he said, you know, really, I'd love to see you give Clinton a hand. I said, well, I don't know. You know. But um, finally, uh, Clinton offered me a position. He offered, first, he wanted me to be uh, ambassador to the UN and be in the cabinet. And I said, well, 
I said, no, that's not all that interesting where I could do things which I think I can be helpful in. Because my whole objective was to be helpful. I mean, I didn't need the job, I didn't need the reputation or anything. It was just I wanted to be helpful. So then he came along and he said, well, how about being Deputy Secretary of State, which is the number two position? And usually that position is one where you're in charge of administration, uh, the running of the department, the huge budget of the, of the foreign budget of the government, and so on. I said, well, that is one where I can perhaps be helpful. And then they also were interested in my uh, reorganizing foreign assistance, USAID. Again, that's in my old field, so okay, I can be helpful in that regard. Um, so I, I accepted. Um, and um, that's what I was doing. I was working on that, and then I would pinch hit for Christopher when he was out of the country doing the ceremonial sorts of things. But I was not at all very heavily involved in foreign policy. They didn't call on me for foreign policy issues. Okay. Uh, but then... Did you find that odd? Yes, at times. And the, but, you know, there's a division of labor in any organization. Uh, and um, if, um, if they had... I mean, I, I volunteered a couple of times certain things. Been paying any attention? Okay, well, you know, I'm not. That's not what I'm been asked to do. So I'm going to do what I'm have been asked to do, which is what I was doing. Uh, but then, when the leaks started out of the White House, um, I was really quite both annoyed and shocked because what happened was that the leaks said that number one, I had no foreign policy experience, which was totally fallacious. Number two that I was responsible for all the failed policies in, in, Viet, in Yugoslavia, and I had not been involved. Um, and these were leaks that were showing up in the press. Yes, yeah. And I, I said, what, wait, what is this, you know? And then when I confronted Christopher on it, and then he and the president issued some lukewarm comments. I said, I've been there before. I said, I'm not doing this. So I submitted my resignation, and a week later we were back here in New York. Why do you think that happened? Which? That the well, leak the, started. The press, the press maintained, and all of the most of the editorials were all over the country, which were very supportive. Said that they were trying to use me as a scapegoat for their failed policies in Yugoslavia. That may be true. I don't know. Did you, know the, is that? Do you see that as the full explanation? I have no idea. I have no idea. I really don't know. But I do know that, as I say, they were in. They were having real problems. They were being attacked on the inadequacies of their foreign policy. And, but the only clue I have is the fact that when the leaks said I was responsible, for example, they said that I was a member of the deputies committee in the White House. Well, I was not a member of that committee. So why would they say that if it wasn't true? They were, they were making me responsible for what was happening. But that's my only explanation. Christopher wasn't doing very well. It's a, it's a very weak yeah. So it's a very, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, I, as I say, I was not going to stand there and sort of fight like I had to uh, continue to be in, the, in this process. I mean, I, didn't, I came there to be helpful. If they don't want to be helpful, they're not going to support me. The heck with it. I mean, I wasn't. Well, some people, you know, would say that, you know, that, that uh, let, let's pause for a second. I think you're, you're. Okay. We have speed. Um, I forgot where we were. We were at uh, TIA Craft. Oh, yes, yes. And we were, we were, we see now you're blocking out. Clinton. We were talking about oh, Clinton. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. yes. I'm blocking, okay. You really don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that all there is to say yeah. about it. Mean, what else? I mean, I mean I what else it just there? seems, uh, for, for, again, for people who don't understand Washington, mm -hmm. who don't understand, you know, for those, for young people who, who look and say, you know, this is the job of a lifetime to be Deputy Secretary of State, and, you know, this is what I'm going to devote my life to, getting there, and then they yeah. hear this kind of story, and it's like, well, what, what lesson comes from yeah. that? What, what should well, I, 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 would, I would have to say that among my friends, my peers, uh, particularly those that I have as friends in the business world, have repeatedly at the time said to me, Cliff, this is why I will never go to Washington. If they would do this to you, I'd never go. And I think that's indicative of 
um, the extent to which um, this pattern uh, leads to um, a definite deficiency in people who are probably could make a contribution. Uh, but um, in terms of um, uh, President Clinton and his administration, I would have to say I was very disappointed at, uh, at the way in which uh, uh, this was, was handled. I, I just was. Um, and do you was, think that race had anything to do with it? I don't know. I really don't know. It may have. <clears throat> it may have in the sense that uh, it may have been that uh, I was chosen, uh, pushed by some, because of racial reasons, rather than because of the qualifications that I had. Um, but to me, it was <laughs> the issue of my having served five previous presidents in foreign policy positions was certainly an indication I had foreign policy credentials. So I don't know whether what was going on in that regard. I just don't. Um, but um, it, um, it was very, as I said afterwards, I said I always said I didn't want to get into that snake pit, and I should have stayed with my position. You know. Dolores, what was your reaction to all of this? I, you asked me about going to Michigan State when we were at ADC, and I said I was very enthusiastic. And I said, well, there was one thing that I was, there was one phase in which I was not enthusiastic, and this was it. I did not want him to go. Why not? I'm, I love politics. I think it's a blast, and I love talking about politics. But I interacted, one of my boards, I interacted with a lot of politicians who were serving on the boards. This is a group they take on boards. I got to know them. I got to know their style. I got to know the clubbiness. I got to know who's in, who's out, uh, how they think. It's an industry. There was a time, I thought, that you get any good, smart American, they ought to be able to step in there and do the job. It's too inbred. It's, it's like saying any good, intelligent person can go and do brain surgery. It doesn't, now, they need some help. Oh, God, don't they really need some help? But it is, it, there are intricacies in there. And I think you have to be in it and brought up in it. You have to have the long time experience in it. You have to know hundreds and hundreds of people in it. You, it it's also a dreadful place for wives to be. You are nothing. Zero. You don't count. You just don't count. I fortunately, you know, I, I have, I've had enough of a background so I, and enough self-confidence that I, I was okay. Uh, and I know how to handle myself socially, no problem. But uh, as far as getting anything for any prestige, any uh, any any position, unless un unless you're the head of the Senate, the head of the head of of the Congress, or your your husband is the head of the, you you're you're nothing. You don't count. You're better off being stay at home. So you're less. You're le you're much less than a secretary. <laughs> really. Oh, yeah, you better believe it. Secretary's got some clout. <laughs> yeah. With, 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 her, with, uh, with, with the boss man. You don't get any clout. Get out of the way. I'll tell you a very... very Is this not true? Oh, yeah. I'll tell you a very funny story, which is true. Uh, as you know, when you go into the uh, government, you are supposed to put every, all of your assets oh. in trust. Or sell them in some fashion and go off your boards, which, okay, I can agree to, you know, I understand that. And it cost, cost us quite a bit to do this. It did. Um, For well, us, it was big money. So it, it, came, it came to Dolores. And at first, they wanted Dolores to go off all of, all the, my boards. All of the corporate boards. A sweep. And so he said, well, now, wait a minute. Why should she go off her boards? You know, she's not being deputy secretary. It was agreed that Cliff would go I off am. his. So we went back and forth on this. So finally it ended up that they would, she could stay on her boards, but she would have to go off of her board of Phillips Petroleum because of big oil. Big oil. They didn't want any, any and, involvement uh, with big any oil. Any decision that I might make, the way it, the argument was the following. We are married, we file a joint income tax. Any decision that I make that positively and helps any of her corporations thereby increases their income, 
and their income is, is her compensation, and therefore her compensation is helped by a decision that I made. Therefore, that's a conflict of interest. So with big oil, that's obvious. It's going to happen anyway, which I, okay. Okay. So I finally said to the Essex officer, I said, let me ask you a question. If we were not married, but just living together, would she have to get off of her board? She said, no. <laughs> I said, that tells you something about family values. <laughs> to me, it was absolutely insane because it assumed that I would not know enough to recuse myself on any decision that might affect her boards and that there was somehow or other would be a collusion between us. I recognize the appearance question, but it was still there. The other side of the coin is there's a very uh, humorous incident that occurred before this when uh, I was on the board of Time, Dolores was on the board of Gannett, and they were engaged in very private, confidential negotiations on a possible merger. Dolores knew about it, I knew about it, we didn't tell each other about it. Okay? It was fun, actually. It we was, had a good time. We, we both knew what was going on, but we didn't talk. You're not supposed to. Just didn't. And when it was all over and it didn't happen, then USA Today had a wonderful story about the two of us in the picture of us that she doesn't tell him and she doesn't tell her. I mean, it was great fun, but <clears throat> we know what you're supposed to do and what you don't do. I mean, it was not a nothing great about it, but this was their, their way. But did, did you have, it, when you realized what was going on in terms of your position being undermined and the leaks, did you have any hesitation about saying, that's it, I'm out of here? No, no, not at all. No, it was like that. Really? No. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't, I didn't, mm -mm. no. Because, you know, I, there, some people would, would say, well, you know, look at Colin Powell, all right? Secretary of State, mm -hmm. same, to some extent, same patterns early on in terms of leaks mm -hmm. coming out, where's Colin Powell, yeah. you know, he's out of favor, he's this, he's that, you know. He, and a lot of people expected that he might say, you know, never mind. Yeah, but see the difference, and that's not, I wouldn't make complete comparison, but uh, at no point did President Bush say anything unsupportive of Colin Powell. He didn't. Um, and this is a case of where you know, your bosses don't give you a full set of support. But it wasn't Clinton as much as it is. Well, why do, we don't know, you know. But the point is that it was not there. So, okay. I don't It was uh, a lack of support. Not, not any, he didn't say, they didn't say anything really ne negative. negative. No. Like Except for saying he didn't have any foreign policy experience. Well, that was the leak. I mean, that was the leak. Yeah. Right. He didn't have any foreign policy. Or that, I, or that I had done the foreign policy on Yugoslavia, which was a big job. Yeah, yeah. which he had not job. done. Do you, do you uh, empathize with, with Colin Powell? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I know the, the, the difficulty, and uh, this is, I guess I can say this at this point. At one point, when Reagan first came into office, uh, some of his closest advisors, whom I knew, were friends of mine, uh, asked me if I wanted to be Secretary of Education. And um, my guess is I probably would have gotten it. But I said no. Now, the reason I said no was very simple. I knew enough about Reagan's position on education, his policies on education, to know that I could not be in a position to defend those positions, given my own values and views. Uh, and that's true in any situation where you are, uh, in a sense, in an administration, whether it's business or government, where at times you have to subsume your views to that of the, of the leader. And um, when you get to a particular stage where you say, I just cannot adopt this position or defend this position or explain this position, in my book, that's when you leave. Uh, I've always admired uh, Cy Vance at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, now, Cy was, I knew Cy, Cy was on the Rockefeller Foundation board with me. And uh, one of the interesting sidelights is that at the, the occasion when Cy became Secretary of State with Carter, there were five of us on the Rockefeller Foundation board who were being touted in the press as future candidates for the cabinet in, in Carter's administration, including me. And I was chairman of the nominating committee at the foundation. I said, don't all of you leave it except at the same time. But 
um, Cy left and went, and then Father Hesburgh became chairman, and then when Father Hesburgh retired, then I became chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation. And at the time when Cy was in the State Department, and he did not agree with Jimmy, President Carter's position on the hostages, he said, I resign. I understood that completely. That was, that was the line where he just could not go. Um, I think Colin Powell has his own line. What it is, I don't know. But you have to. I mean, you can't just say, I will take Well, his is probably anything. a loyalty line. Yeah, you know, but you can't, loyal to the, you to can't, the team, uh, the president. You have, to, you have to have some line where you say, I just can't, uh, in terms of my values and my beliefs. You just don't. And in my case, that was it. I just couldn't do it.